synthétique. Naturelle ou même vivante, ces membranes prennent la forme de dispositifs. Elles ont en commun d'être interconnectées, sensibles à leur environnement et soumises au regard d'un public. À la manière d'un réseau de veines protoplasmiques, un maillage organique et tentaculaire se déploie. Sa quête Saisir une information, un résidu d'énergie ou même des nutriments. Transducteur électroacoustique bioplastique naturel ou même plasmode, autant de substances actives à même de sentir et restituer d'importantes quantités de données aussi complexes que dynamiques. Ces dispositifs composés de matières en activité captent, assemblent et matérialisent les discrets signaux de l'environnement afin d'en proposer une expérience sensible. On se trouve ici dans la galerie restaurant du Dalan Art Gallery de Revan en Arménie. Inspiré du légendaire sens de l'hospitalité arménien, ce dispositif invite le public dans un dialogue. Alors que les participants boivent, mangent et débattent, des informations liées à la respiration et au mouvement sont collectées en temps réel. L'environnement semble répondre à l'état de chaque participant. Des faisceaux de lumière prennent corps sur la table, des sonorités émergent de membranes acoustiques, et les objets se meuvent tout au long du dîner. Nous sommes ici au cœur du forum moins 1 du centre Pompidou à Paris. Une membrane de bioplastique flotte librement dans le vide. À sa surface se devine un agencement complexe de composants électroniques. Il s'agit d'un dispositif d'affichage qui se répète d'un pan à l'autre en s'estompant subtilement. Cette empreinte organique animé par l'énergie résiduelle du lieu, nous ramène aux limites perceptives, matérielles et bidimensionnelles des écrans. Enfin, nous sommes ici dans un laboratoire. Nous observons Physarum polycephalum, un organisme unicellulaire composé de membranes plasmiques, affamées. Il se déplace sans relâche pour se nourrir de matière organique végétal ou animal, et peut atteindre jusqu'à 5 cm par heure. Aussi connu sous le nom de blob, ces mouvements peuvent être analysés par la méthode de détection éponyme, blob détection. Il est ici question de comprendre dans quelle mesure l'activité du blob peut agir au cœur de dispositifs situés dans des environnements publics. Ceci questionne alors la capacité de ces lieux à accueillir et montrer le vivant dans son comportement le plus authentique. En effet, si on attribuait une certaine organicité vivante à des images en mouvement, comment les montrer autrement que dans une boîte scellée Que faire alors des cycles naturels, de la décomposition, de la moisissure, des bactéries, des souches incontrôlables et incontrôlées qui siègent sous nos semelles, comme dans notre organisme même Dans la mesure où ces membranes engagent les sens et la perception dans un dialogue à même de sensibiliser des publics, des spectateurs et des citoyens avec leur environnement de vie, il convient de repenser les lieux d'exposition. Si ces lieux participent de la conception, voire de la transformation des œuvres, il est nécessaire de se demander de quelle manière ces œuvres peuvent faire acte d'information, de contre-information ou même, comme disait Gilles Deleuze, de résistance. Hello everyone and welcome to this live cooking show where we're gonna see natural dyes and bio dyes. Um, so this workshop is part of the planetary thinking ecological crisis theme of the festival. This topic is completely aligned with my research creation addressing the polluting aspect of the textile and the fashion industry. 
As you probably know, fashion is one of the most polluting industry in the world, and synthetic dyes are part of this issue. So many scientific studies have shown the toxicity and negative impact on health. So we're gonna discuss how to make a natural dyes to, uh, to find alternatives to this toxicity. Let's start by giving you a little bit of context. I'm particularly interested in this issue because I've been working in fashion for 20 years as a textile designer. And color is therefore my main tool to express ideas. And as such, I became really interested in sustainable pigments. Natural dyes usually requires a lot of water and cultivable lands. So I was rather interested in repurposing something already there. I was really inspired by the concept of cradle to cradle from William McDonough and the chemist Michael Braungart. So I started to look at waste and food waste as a potential resource to develop local dyes. So as you can see on the pictures, uh, avocados, onions, or here on the tables, uh, black beans, uh, red onions versus yellow onions, um, red cabbage, and a few uh, different examples like that. I had also a look at various researchers and designers' initiatives around the world. For example, uh, the Atelier Luma in France is developing local dyes from um, uh, invasive plants, algae, or agricultural wastes, for example. This approach of looking at local resources is also part of a bigger picture called Fiber Shed and developed by Rebecca Burgess. The idea is, uh, consists of producing uh, garments from soil to soils. So the interest here is to look at uh, the, the local resources to produce color. So which kind of food waste could we use to, uh, to create colors? You have to know that each ingredient is gonna give you a specific shade. And later you can modulate this shade by uh, modifying the pH of the bath and keeping, uh, keeping it more acid or, or alkaline. So now we're gonna, gonna discuss the choice of the fibers. As you can see here on the, on the image or on the table, according to the fibers you are dying, you get different shades. Like for, for example, protein fibers from animals are getting brighter shades, brighter hue, uh, like silk or wool. And cellulosic fibers like linen or cotton are gonna get uh, lighter shades. What I advise you to do when you start dyeing with natural dyes uh, is to keep a recipe book, to keep record of everything you do, to keep track of your test, uh, in order to be able to reproduce your colors because dyeing a fabric is quite easy, but re reproducing the right shade is quite um, tricky. So you have to keep in mind, you have to note uh, the weight of, of the waste you're gonna dye, the waste of the fabric uh, you're gonna you're gonna die to be able to uh, to make this shade again. You hold, you also have to note the kind of the type of mordant you're gonna you're gonna use. Mordant is uh, a bath made of alum. The alum is what I use, um, but you get a lot of good ideas uh, on the website of Maiwa, for example, gives a recipe of uh, different mordants from alum or according to the protein fibers or the cellulosic fibers, you're gonna get uh, different recipes. Um, mm -hmm. So once, once you get your, your different waste, you, we're gonna start to make decoction. So ideally today I wanted to cook live with you, but because it takes a bit of time, I prepared all the decoction today, uh, as you can see on the, on the screen, and I'm gonna explain you the process. So here is the first recipe. Uh, the first thing is to gather the right amount of food waste. Every time I cook, I gather my waste, I ask my neighbors, but also, you know, when we, can, we want to get a uh, bigger scale, maybe ask uh, local restaurants, groceries, or create collaboration with uh, different uh, companies to gather the, the, the food waste. So for the first um, dye we're gonna make today is made with onion and uh, particularly yellow onion dyes. Uh, for, this, uh, for this one here, 
for this kind of amount of fabric, I used four liters of water in a stainless steel pot. This is very important because if it's not stainless, it can affect the color of the dyes and you won't get as bright a color. Um, it's also important to keep a track and check the water pH. So water usually is medium, six pH. And what I did for this amount of fabric, I chopped, I finely chopped, uh, so you can, you know, when you chop your, uh, your fiber, your dyes, you get a brighter color. So I chopped uh, 50 grams of uh, onion skin in, and then I put them in cold water. Then I bring that to boil and I cook it for one hour. And uh, to get the maximum pigment out of the, the skin, I let it cool down and stand overnight. And the following day I filter and press in a fabric, I really press the onion skin very hard to extract the maximum of pigment. Then I put the wet premodented textile in the bath. What I call premodented textile is the day before or even weeks before uh, you can um, dig as my recipe, you're gonna check on their website, but you dig the, you dip your fabric in this mordant and then you let it dry. And right before to dye, it's very important to wet it again. So you put your wet premodented textile in the bath. You cook it for about an hour and then you let it cool down overnight. Uh, you rinse it well, you dry it away from the sun and then I advise you to wash it with a gentle soap only uh, a few days after to keep the maximum of the shade. But uh, onions really hold a very strong tan tanner and keeps the color very hard on the fabric. It's not really, uh, it has a very good lice fastness and it's very, uh, very, it stays on fabric very well. Uh, here I gave you an example of another recipe. For example, I scale up the, the recipe. I was dyeing three meters of fabric, 10 foot of uh, wool jersey. So for this amount, I put 30 liters of water in a huge stainless steel pot. And I put, and I use 320 grams of onion skin, which is quite a lot because onion skins are quite light. Uh, you have to be aware that to warm up all this huge amount of water, it takes up to four hours to reach a boiling point. Then you cook it for one hour and the same process, you let it cool and stand overnight, filter it and use it as a bath. Uh, the, all the recipes are a bit the same, like for example, avocado, onions, you have to boil the ingredients uh, for about an hour. Here, here is the one I used here for the, for this amount of fabric. Also, I used four liters of water. What is very important is to allow enough water, enough space for the fabric to, uh, to move freely. Otherwise, you're gonna, it's gonna stain your, your fabric. So it's why I use more water that I, I really indeed need it. You can also use uh, twice your bath, like the first bath is gonna be darker and then um, more you, you dye and lighter is getting your, your bath. Uh, and then it's the same recipe. Uh, here we see, um, sometimes people are surprised, how come I get a pink shade when I dye with avocado, which is uh, green at first? It's because avocado holds um, a red um, tana and here we can see it on this picture. Uh, as you notice, you know, sometimes when you cut the pit or your avocado, you get this pink shade on it. So it's this pink pigment that is gonna dye your fabric. While you're cooking the fabric, you have to uh, mix it uh, constantly. I mean, quite, quite um, often to avoid uh, stains and to, to, to dye it and then um, so I was talking about warm and hot uh, techniques. Here, uh, concerning black dyes, I I'm using the soaking water of uh, black beans. The dye is cold, so uh, you leave it overnight. You put your, before to cook your big recipe of uh, black beans, you leave it overnight, and then you filter the following day, 
And what I add a little bit is, um, is a bit of iron, but the iron you take, you know, as a, as a supplement, a food supplement. So I put a, a, a little bit of iron, and then I, I leave my fabric overnight in this bath. And here I got this uh, beautiful uh, different shades of blue. And according to the kind of uh, beans I use, sometimes I can get some blacks or grays. It depends. It can vary the shades. Uh, what is fun also when you dye with uh, natural dyes is you can modulate your colors by changing the acidity or the alkali alkalinity of the bath. So here on the example, uh, I was modulating um, my uh, fabric that I dyed with grape. So grape is very sensitive to pH. Like for example, onion and avocado are less sensitive, so you cannot modulate them as much. But in the case of grape or, or red cabbage, they are very sensitive to pH, so you can have a lot of fun. And as you can see on the, the image, you can vary the, the, the shades by uh, getting blue. More you get alkaline, um, so it means it's a pH above 6, 6, 8, 9, 10. Um, you will get blue, blues, or um, grays, and uh, green. And if you get more acid, like minus 2 alkaline, uh, minus 2 of acidity, you will get more uh, pink, bright pink, reddish colors. So here we can see uh, the transformation of the grape, uh, the grape decoction I made, um, and by adding some uh, lemon, uh, you get some uh, brighter shades. So here we can see, um, like more acid is pinker, and uh, greer, greener and bluer is more alkaline. And for darker shades, I use a little bit of iron too. So you can make your own modifier. You can use vinegar, but you can also use food waste to make your acid modifier. Here I use lemon, for example. So basically you can use everything from the lemon. You can grate the peel and use the zest for a recipe. You can make juice and save it for your daily drink. And you can freeze your lemon peels. When you get enough, it's about uh, 10 lemons for five liters of water I used uh, for my recipe. But it can be less than that also. You boil it for one hour, and then you can keep it on the f in the fridge for a few days, or you can freeze it for later use. And then you dip your textiles uh, for a few seconds, and the, the change is instant. It's quite fast. And then thanks to this uh, technique, you can uh, play and extend the, the shades of, uh, of your colors. Uh, at first, you get a, a purple. Here it was the example shown here is with red cabbage. After it's first it was purple and then uh, getting more pink with acidity, getting more blue and green with alkalinity uh, and baking soda. Uh, the second technique I'm going to explain today is uh, bio dyes uh, working with living organisms. Here I work with um, bacteria. These bacteria um, are naturally producing pigments. And, but we can extend the change of the pigments by, uh, by mod modulating um, the temperature, uh, the, the nutrients you give. And uh, the colors are growing within 48 hours. So it's quite an interesting avenue. Um, it grows in the lab. And it doesn't take that much uh, water. So here again, what is very important is to keep track of what you do, uh, which kind of nutrients, uh, which kind of uh, fibers you dye, um, how long you keep it, and in which uh, environments, humidity, temperature, everything has to be recorded to be able to, to match it uh, again. Here I also use for this technique um, food waste to make uh, nutrients for the pigments. So I use uh, um, apple uh, peel decoctions, orange decoction, uh, avocado, onion, so uh, everything I have around to make a different test. And then the bacteria is growing on these different agars. Agar is, um, is extracting from algae, and is what is going to give the, the nutrients to the, the bacteria. So here I'm preparing liquid cultures uh, with these different decoctions. 
and according to the acidity, again, uh, the sweetness or sourness of the, the bath, uh, the, the dye, the, the bacteria is going to react differently. So here we can see a different test where I'm dyeing uh, different, with different uh, waste, but also different fibers. Um, so this is the first day I try with uh, different uh, linen, cotton, I try with avocado, beans, and then I check after 24 hours. And after 48 hours is uh, the maximum dyes of the fabric, of the bacteria, what you can offer. So you get bright colors. At that stage, the bacteria is still alive. Then you have to autoclave it to kill the bacteria and get uh, the shade uh, you want. So here you see the variation of colors is mostly because of the difference of fibers. Uh, on wool, I get dark, dark um, shades of red with onion, for example, while on silk, I get brighter uh, pinks. And on uh, cellulosic fibers like cotton or linen, I, I get uh, light uh, purple uh, colors. So I was interested in, in trying to extend this color palette a bit more. So I started to mix um, the decoction of uh, food waste and the bacteria. Also, what is interesting when you work with living organisms is to observe their behavior. Here, for example, by working with it, I noticed that bacteria likes to be constrained in tight spaces. So by building um, and by making stencils, I was able to uh, guide the growth of the bacteria and to uh, produce prints uh, to print on the, the garments. So here, for example, we can see I prepared uh, a black agar made with uh, black beans. And then I put this, um, this stencil on the top and I applied the bacteria. And after 48 hours, I get all these bright uh, colors um, that could give the pattern I was, uh, I was looking for. This pattern was inspired by this uh, um, this movement, the zigzag movement used, commonly used in microbiology to inoculate uh, plates. And here we can see uh, a piece of clothing I dyed and I printed. I dyed with avocado dyes and I overprinted using bacteria. So the, red, the bright red color is when the bacteria is still alive. And after autoclaving, the, according to the the, the fibers the, the bacteria grown on, um, the, the, the red becomes a, a purple uh, color. Uh, so what is interesting here is by mixing this uh, food waste and this um, bacteria, I could get all the, the pantone shades commonly used in, um, in, the, in the fashion industry. So I could really extend the, the palette. And so, yeah, that's it for today. I explained everything. Um, you can uh, also, I mean, in, if in the chat there are some questions, I could also uh, answer to some of your questions. And uh, also you can check on Instagram and reach me. Welcome to the material workshop on building an open source microbial fuel cell. My name is Matthew Halpenny. I'm a uh, bio artist and media artist based in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, my work primarily deals with, um, well, in the last year and a half, microbial fuel cells. And I'm going to take you through my research creation process of how I got to building the fuel cells, which you can see here. Um, when I started building these a year and a half ago, uh, I, I didn't really know anything about microbial fuel cells. So when I come at this from a research creation perspective, it's going to come from the basics and work up. Um, 
And there are many forms of microbial fuel cells. Uh, you'll see this one throughout the slides. I'll show you other varieties of microbial fuel cells. And um, it's, it's usually these are built by engineers. And um, what I tried to do is take it, all the engineering aspects and make them accessible for basically anyone who wants to create these for art or whatever purposes. Um, so this is the layout of what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about microbial fuel cells. Um, and we're going to go through the making process of them and talk about open source. Um, and at the, at the end, I'll talk a bit about the sustainability because you can see that there's 3D printing. So there's a few things to talk about in that regards and embodied energy, but that'll be very quick. Um, and then we're going to kind of do a, a Q&A session. So for examples of microbial fuel cells, we have these artworks. Um, I won't go into detail on all of them because there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, but you can see there's different types already. We have plant-based ones, um, like two chambers with water and mud. Um, we've got algae reactors, mosses. Um, so I'll take you through all of these and kind of show you how these artists got to where they are. Um, like I said, they vary a lot. Uh, the ones you see in labs are often very small and compact and very efficient. Um, we're going to be trying to not aim for efficiency, but um, accessibility. Uh, so ours won't be as powerful as these ones here, but they'll be uh, much more accessible. They work by harvesting uh, energy in the form of ions from the metabolic processes of anaerobic bacteria. So these are bacteria that live in like the mud and the soil, swamps, et cetera. Um, and when they break down matter, they produce these ions. Uh, these ions act as kind of a residual energy source. So we have stuff like this in batteries, but instead of extracting from the earth to get these batteries, we're taking it from natural environments. Um, so how this ionic energy works is you have uh, a cathode and an anode on each end of the cell, one of them's exposed to air or water. Um, and it's essentially just the flow of electrons from the metabolic pathways that the bacteria create. Um, and we attach a circuit and the cathode is going to have reactions with the protons in the soil and that's gonna create a pull that goes through. Um, yeah, it's a little bit confusing, but um, also all of this is going to be available on a PDF afterwards. So if you want to read through it by yourself, it's all there. Um, so the electrodes, uh, usually electrodes are you know pieces of metal, uh, but here we're going to be working primarily with carbon. Uh, the reason we use carbon is because it's very porous and it gives the uh, bacteria a place to grow, like all of these threads. So they form biofilms in the threads which have a much, much greater surface area um, because we have all of these tiny threads instead of one plate. Um, and the reason we need this is because the ions we're pulling are much less than you would get from a chemical battery. Um, so yeah, as I said, there's many different examples. Um, we're kind of just gonna focus on uh, soil-based ones in this workshop, but I have resources at the end of the workshop if you want to further explore for yourself. Um, so this is a floating one, just for an example. Um, we have trees in a pot that's floating in the water, and uh, outside of the pot is a cathode that reacts with the water, and we have a little um, circuit in there that's going to create energy, and, and maybe it's powering a sensor network, which is usually what researchers do, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, I'm not gonna go into the circuit now, but Basically what it's doing is we're getting uh, energy that's around 20 millivolts in the soil. And for reference, much of the digital technologies we use today are 3.3 volts. So we really need to step that up and that's why we have to create this circuit. Um, I tried my best to find circuits that are fairly pre-made, but oddly they just don't exist. Uh, researchers do not publish their circuits a lot of the times, um, but there are a few options you can do with minimal modifications. So the types, we have uh, mud-based, so methanogenic uh, anaerobes. We have plant-based ones, uh, remediative cells, so this uses wastewater for uh, like city sewage systems, et cetera. 
And then we have bryophyte-based ones, which are similar to soil ones, and these are the ones that I made. So when we talk about these, it also can be kind of applied to the plant ones as well. So like I said, anaerobic um, mud ones live in environments without oxygen. So often that's wetlands, swamps, et cetera. Um, and there's actually uh, methane gas coming out of these swamps from the methogenic bacteria. Um, so it's very like potent and pungent and kind of like a, a stinky soil to work with. Uh, but it's very, very powerful compared to the other ones. So that's an option if you want to do that. Um, wastewater, not going to go into too much, but it's pretty interesting because there's certain systems that are in place that can take sewage and turn it into electricity within cities. So very interesting research avenue. And then again, bryo MFCs. So bryophytes are like mosses. Um, mosses aren't the only bryophytes, but they're the ones we're going to focus on. Um, the reason they're interesting for this is they don't have roots, but they have tiny rhizoids, and those rhizoids dig into the carbon electrodes and create a very uh, surface area intense film over the electrodes. Uh, so to do this, again, here's the carbon fiber, which we're going to get into later, and you can just grow the moss right on it. Moss doesn't really need soil a lot of the times. Um, it does like certain mixtures, like in this case, they mix the carbon with paper that can decompose, um, and you get better results when you have some sort of um, fertilizer or something they can, the bacteria can digest for the mosses to also benefit from. So all of this comes from the approach of critical making and open source. Why are we building these microbial fuel cells? Well, for one, they are a very interesting revenue of energy research that doesn't extract from the earth. It's much slower, but throughout the years, it can maybe provide a more sustainable energy system. Um, and as creators and artists and non-engineers, it's kind of important to go through this cycle because a lot of the sustainable energy systems that are put in place today are behind closed paywalls and uh, certain companies that own rights to these systems. And as a public consumer, we don't really get a say in how the design process works. So by creating it, we get to learn more about it. We get to create new things, suggest new designs, and hopefully influence the sustainable energy market. Um, pretty much more of what I just said, but this design here, I'm going to post a link in swap card after, or um, you can always contact me for it. And it has a PDF of this presentation and actually the printer cells uh, files for these cells. So I'll get more into how to use those in a sec. And of course, this is like a very complicated process to create these. So each one, like the, the printing and the electrodes and the electronics could take an hour by themselves. So we're just going to kind of dot the points and give you rep avenues to explore instead of kind of digging fully into it. Um, and then there's more resources at the end that you can explore, but hopefully this saves a lot of time if you want to make microbial fuel cells because you know where to look and, and what to do. So this cell here is the open source design that you're going to be able to print. And you have your two anodes, or the anode and cathode, your cell body, and then you have this thing at the bottom, which I'll get into, that um, basically fixes the cathode to the bottom where there's an air hole. Um, transparent lid or semi-transparent lid is kind of important because you want some light to get through to your mosses or plants. Um, so this is kind of like the process we're going to go through. I'm going to talk about how I printed these or how you can upcycle them with plastic containers. Um, and then kind of very quickly talk about how you can design them yourselves or modify the designs. Electrodes and electronics after that. So the cell body varies very much from different cells. Of course, like we have water-based ones, which are going to have kind of systems like this, where you close off both sides, and then you have electrodes in the middle, so water can't escape. We're not going to be really talking about that. We're more of the ones where you have kind of like a pot that uh, your plants sit in. And you can make these pots also, yeah, like I said, out of Tupperwares or different plastics. Um, but the efficiency kind of is semi-important, um, so I'm going to talk about how to do it 
in a way where you'll actually get energy from it. Um, one of the images I showed earlier is an art project called Moss FM, and this is the actual sketch from that project that they supply for free. Um, so this cell right here that I built is based off of that. Um, and you can also build a cell just like this if you want. Um, I have, I 3D printed it, but it's very easy to make a container. Um, so these are my very first examples. So if you want to know where to start, like this is theirs. They also have a plastic container that looks fairly upcycled, just bolts from the hardware store. Uh, stainless steel mesh, which I'll get into again, but uh, you can just buy it at any hardware store. Um, so yeah, printing them. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I'm also going to start, I don't know if you noticed in the open source section, but I'm going to have icons here at the top so you know which section we're talking about because everything kind of blends into each other. So the gaskets are that part that I mentioned before. I'm just going to, this one has it open. It's this here, and it's important you have gaskets on the bottom. So it's kind of hard to see, but it's in there. And what that does is it allows you to tighten the cell really tight so that the cathode at the bottom has uh, no air that can escape out of the cell. And that way it's forced to go through the electrode. Um, as you can see, it's kind of hard to cut. Like mine's not very pretty, but you can also laser cut them, um, which is a little more complicated, but it's an option. For nuts and bolts, one thing to consider is if you're using metal, make sure it is waterproof because otherwise it's going to ruin your electrodes when it oxidizes. Even like galvanized screws like these ones will oxidize a little bit and ruin your electrodes. So I've also included um, 3D printable screws that you can print and these are completely waterproof and they won't rust. Um, and you can make these yourself in the design program I'm going to show you later. Um, lids, I won't go too much into this but you, you kind of want to have it semi-transparent, so you need to look for transparent filaments, but they're going to print like this, and it's going to let in some light, but not a lot. If you want it to let in more light, you have to coat it with special um, chemicals that will create a, a flat surface instead of the striations that printers create. You can also make it out of transparent vinyl and do something like Velcro on the sides to create a little greenhouse. Um, so. The 3D printing section, again, not everyone's going to have access to 3D printers, so if you don't, that's okay. Um, it does make things a lot easier because you can make things very airtight, um, which is important for these cells. And as you can see here, you can print the entire cell in just one go. Um, if you don't have access to a printer, you can usually find them at maker spaces if you live in a city, universities, libraries, etc. You can also order prints from people online. Um, or if you are going to do a lot of research with printers, you can buy a cheap printer for up to $300. But you probably want to buy one that's not too finicky, because these printers, uh, the cheap ones, can be a lot of technical uh, learning slopes. But some of them are catered for people who don't want to do the technical stuff. These are different kinds. We're going to be talking about FDM, which just goes layer by layer, um, like this on the left. There's also resin if you want to get into that, but we're not going to talk about resin. Um, they usually use PLA. You can use different filaments. Um, there's PETG, ABS, there's flexible ones, but PLA is mostly compostable, um, so that's a plus. I'm going to talk about that in the sustainability section because it's a bit of a, it's a little greenwashed, but there are options that aren't. Um, I'll leave this here if you want to come back to the PDF to learn how which things are the printer, but they have three motors. When you print, the bed just aligns itself to where the extruder is, or the bed goes one way, the extruder goes another way. Um, and it essentially goes line by line, layer by layer, and then moves upwards. To do this, you need STL files. Uh, I supply you STL files in the link I'm going to send. Um, basically all that is is a file that will show the geometry of the object but to get it on a printer you also have to turn it into g-code so each printer is going to have slicers uh, there's one called 
Um, did I put it in here? Yeah, Cura, which works with many, many printers, and it's free. Um, a lot of printers are also open source, like Prusa, and um, it means you can modify things, or there's a, a big community that can help you if anything goes wrong. So some researchers already have started doing this. This is a wastewater cell I found. I couldn't actually find the file, but they said it was accessible. Um, but yeah, again, you can just print it, and it saves you a lot of time and cost because these things can be quite expensive um, from lab-grade suppliers. This is, again, the, the cell, which I'm going to show you how I designed that object because this is actually from the design program. So if you want to get into that, you have to use like a CAD software, and it's a little complicated to get into, so this one is really short. But uh, I use Fusion 360. It's free for hobbyists and makers. It essentially lets you design the cell kind of like in a 3D program, but you can go back to steps and modify your screw size, your hole size. Uh, you can delete objects, import objects, et cetera. It's, it's much more accessible for when you have many different parts. Um, pretty much said that. So this is the software. Again, you have all the parts on the side, um, and you can go back in the timeline and change things very easily. You can import object by object to print. Um, so if you're thinking about doing this and you want to use a 3D software, like maybe avoid Blender and go for this option, uh, just because you're working with so many different parts. So for the electrodes, again, we're going to be using carbon ones mostly. These people here are making a giant powerhouse out of hundreds of these, and they're just using Tupperwares and mud that they found in a swamp. And again, you can see all their noses are plugged because it does really smell this stuff. These are the materials. Um, if you're making your own, activated charcoal is going to be the one we're going to use. You can find it at pet stores uh, because it's used in aquariums, so it's very easy to get. The other ones I'm going to talk about are carbon paper and graphite felt, which are a little harder to get a hold of. Um, graph oil, carbon fiber brush, not used in this design, but also electrodes. Graphene is super, super efficient, but expensive and not really worth it for this stuff. Um, yeah, again, so they're, they're really good because they're porous, but they're also rust resistant, um, which is important. You have to be careful when buying it too because carbon has many forms or in chemistry it's called allotropes, and some are more conductive than others. So you want to stick to like aquarium grade activated charcoal, for instance. And if you do use charcoal, you're going to use this method, or this method is the easiest. Uh, you just use a mortar and pestle. So step by step, you're going to take the carbon, you're going to crush it in a pestle till it gets to a very fine powder. Um, then you're going to take a stainless steel mesh, which you can get from a hardware store. They're used in windows and gardens. Uh, you're going to cut it in a circle, and be careful when cutting it because it is really sharp and it can kind of prick your finger. You might want to use gloves or use uh, big metal snips, but you can just use it with sharp scissors. Then you want to take the charcoal and fix it to the surface of the cell, so you can use epoxy to do that. But because we need it really, really tight to touch the stainless steel, you also want to clamp it. Uh, if you don't have a hydraulic pump, like I did not, uh, you can use just a C-clamp and some pieces of wood or scrap, etc. Uh, if you are a car owner, you might have a hydraulic pump, uh, and you, you can adapt it for this. Uh, what, you want to let the epoxy dry, and then when that's done, you can put it in your cell. Uh, I also forgot to say that you want to affix a wire in the epoxy that's touching the stainless steel because that wire is going to run out of your cell. So like you can see here, the wire is attached to the um, cathode at the top, then it comes out of the cell. The anode is the same thing, but it's buried at the bottom, so you have a gradient that moves upwards. You can get lab-grade ones. I often use lab-grade ones because... They're, they're easier. They eliminate one aspect of the process that's difficult because you know they're going to work. Um, sometimes when you make your own electrodes, something could go wrong. Maybe it's not pressurized enough. Maybe the charcoal's not right. 
So if you want to just start off knowing that it's going to work, you can try and find these. Um, they're very hard to source. I get them from the states. Where you are is going to be different. Um, but they're also expensive to ship because they're lab grade stuff and there's import duty and whatnot. But yeah, you can use felt and paper. And the felt's really good because it's like this thick, spongy material and the rhizoids or the roots can grow right into it. Um, you can also put holes in it that let plants like sit inside of it. Um, the carbon paper is much thinner. I have one here and this kind of goes in the, the fixture that attaches it to your um, cell. Um, putting these in your cell, you can use two methods. Again, we have the stainless steel from the hardware store. All you need to do is kind of clamp it in. So you put it in between this with a rubber gasket and you just sandwich it as tight as you can get. You can also use uh, conductive thread, which is the next method, but you can combine them to kind of staple it or like sew it into the stainless steel. And that way you have a lot more contact. Um, you can buy this stainless steel thread online in places like Adafruit or different suppliers. Uh, you can use it in sewing machines too if you want to be really um, thorough about it. You can do it by hand. Uh, I, I really like this method because it doesn't hurt as much if you accidentally touch it. And um, you can sew it right in, attach it to wires, and uh, you don't really need to worry about it as much. You can also crimp on different connectors like DuPonts. Um, I have one in here, and it just lets you like plug right into it. And the reason that this is handy is because these are not very strong. And as I'll talk about later, you kind of need to chain them together to get enough energy most of the time. Um, because we're not using lab-grade efficiency, we make up for that with usually quantity, like three or four or as many as you want. Um, and again, just to, to reiterate, this will all be available to you after. If you're, if you're not uh, following along, uh, it is going very fast. So yeah, you can see it later if you, if you want. But to just pause for a second, um, what I was saying about connecting, you can see that these artworks all, this is a chain of probably 30 microbial fuel cells in each stack, all chained into a center um, kind of bioreactor. Uh, again, you have all these wires chaining them together. Over there, we have 10 MOS batteries that are powering a radio. And then the electronics. So this part's also the most diverse. Um, it's really going to vary depending on what cell you're building, um, how much energy you're getting out of it, et cetera. So I'm kind of just going to go through uh, the easiest route to build one. And I have an example here. Uh, we're going to talk about this prefabricated energy harvesting chip. And all you have to do is add a few components, and you can use that. Um, but you're going to have to code it in whatever language is most comfortable to you because you have to pair it with a microcontroller. So these chips are meant for energy harvesting, which is what microbial fuel cells do. And energy harvesting is just using residual energy from the environment. So wind, solar, um, heat differentials, and in this case, uh, soil ions. And it's usually very low voltage. This one's considered ultra low because it's so small and you need to use special boards but they're very hard to find a lot of them there's a lot of boards that came out in like 2014 ish and they disappeared this one's still available super cheap it was like eight dollars um, I think this is probably the best route to go uh, the LTC 3108-1 I also have the data sheet for it included in the resources because um, otherwise you might be just really chasing down so many revenues of discontinued chips. Um, this is considered a power management circuit. Um, so it's just all the components you need to attach to your microcontroller. You have input from your cell here. Oops. And then you have a microcontroller on the other side. So the 
the parts in this, you're going to have to always buy a transformer, which is this tiny little square. You can see it there. Um, those are the ones that you use with the LTC 3108-1. We are using the 1 to 100 ratio one. So again, you can come back and, and look through these sheets if you want to build your own. Um, I did at one point in my research creation want to build my own circuit open source to have it available for people, but that's still a ways away. Um, this, these things are supercapacitors. Um, they're kind of going to be the energy backup. So when you're harvesting energy, you have to dump it somewhere because you're not supplying the microcontroller with energy all the time. These, um, if you're stepping up like one millivolt to 3.3 volts, obviously it's not sustainable to just pull it all the time. You kind of have to slowly build it up in a battery and then discharge it. Or not a battery, sorry, a supercapacitor. You can use batteries, but these are easier. And um, basically they're all going to be 5.5. That works. It's okay. As long as your voltage isn't above the rated one. And I'm going to show you exactly how to hook it up, that you can come back to this. You have parts on that board. In the data sheets, it shows you the pins. And these are what you connect. So you can just go step by step, like, OK, I need a capacitor here. Um, you need a capacitor here. I, I say this all later. You have to connect the LTC3108 in a certain configuration. It, it takes some time to fiddle around with and get, but it really is all step by step if you take this route. You just have to follow the steps, and you'll get it working. Um, you can refer to this one if you come back to it. It, it tells you kind of what everything does and where to plug it. Um, this is another, this is the first one I built. Um, you can just do it on a breadboard like this. Although I recommend soldering it to a PCB at some point, um, or sorry, a protoboard at some point, because the, these leak voltage a little bit, and since you're using such low voltage, that can be a problem. Microcontrollers, common ones, ESP, ESP32, uh, STM's really good. They have this one called the blue pill you can use because it works with Arduino, and most people you know Arduino, so that's kind of the, the maker community usually uses this one. And to talk about batteries, MFCs kind of want to replace batteries at some point, and a lot of researchers use them as remote sensor networks that harvest energy from the environment, no batteries, just environmental energy, and then they send data off to a research center by themselves. Um, that way they never have to go in the environment and disturb it. Uh, it just constantly gets energy and sends it out. Um, those MFCs are kind of tricky, so what we're going to do in this case is just use a very small battery to minimize our impact. That's another approach that researchers use, but it's kind of the simpler approach. Uh, all it does is it supplies your microcontroller with energy at all times. It's going to be hibernating, so it's going to use very little. And this can probably last up to like three years sometimes. But your controller is going to go to sleep. It's going to wake up at a certain point. Uh, this can actually tell it to wake up. Um, that's in the data sheet. But yeah, it's going to be sleeping. It's going to wake up. It's going to say, OK, we have energy. And it's going to send it off to your sensors, your LEDs, whatever you want to power with your MFC. Um, again, yeah, the controller can tell you how to do it. I'm, not, I'm just going to leave this here because um, there's some more stuff to get through. But as I was saying, it's very slow. So in this research in 2014, uh, this is the first kind of paper that I read on microbial fuel cells that made sense to me. Um, they have two capacitors, and basically they're using the second capacitor to charge their sensors and their radio signals that they're sending out to the research station. It takes 31 hours for the first one to go off, and then 12-hour intervals, which is actually pretty good for microbial fuel cells. So we're really talking slow. And to get these to work, the biofilms have to grow into the electrodes. So they actually take time to kind of foster, and you need to care for them for like a month or so before you get good results, um, which is also why I built this, because you have the enclosure. Mosses just need uh, humidity inside and like a little felt to grow on. And you can just leave them like this by themselves for however long you need. It's good to check on them once in a while. But yeah, you're going to need to wait. Um, 
which is also something that I find very interesting about microbial fuel cells from um, a theoretical point of view um, because we're so used to this fast-moving society and all our electronics working faster and quicker and more efficiently. But even with sustainable technologies, um, they, they need probably longer times usually and we're expecting them to produce as much energy as we're using now. But we're still using this energy paradigm that's based off of industrial standards and extracting from the earth the coal and oil and burning it. And it's, it operates on a different time scale than maybe what is sustainable. Like, uh, to be sustainable, maybe we need to go slower instead of making technologies to compensate for what we're losing in extractive technologies. Some challenges you might face. Again, you're going to need to chain them probably. That's easy to do, especially if you're printing them. It takes a lot of the work out because you just print one after the other. If you have a big printer, you can print multiple at a time. Um, you want to check on a multimeter probably how much voltage you're getting. So you can test as the cell's uh, growing how much is there. Um, you need to put it basically on the lowest setting to be able to get anything. And even then, it's probably going to be in the decimal points. Uh, th to actually get a really good reading, you need specific equipment. But you can do it with a hobbyist multimeter and power supply. Um, right, and also if the current's not going, super high. Could be your electrodes are too far apart. It's better if they're closer. And it could be that if you made your own, there's not enough surface area in the carbon that was crushed. Um, so kind of what I just talked about with extractive technologies. Um, there's a lot of greenwashing going around with sustainable technologies. Um, and some of them have more energy put into their production and their electronics than they'll ever save um, from burning oil. Um, so things like solar panels are not always you know, offsetting carbon because it takes so much energy to build them and that energy comes from oil. So we need to kind of look at the manufacturing process and there could be issues with these because they're electronics, but it's hard to avoid that. It's just something that you know, to be aware of it with sustainable technologies because it's not a save all just using these. Um, yeah, and on that note too, uh, plastics. So as I said, there's a lot of greenwashing even with plastics. So they say PLA is compostable because uh, it's made from cornstarch. But the thing is you need to use very specific equipment running for like a year long just to get it to decompose. And that takes a lot of energy. Um, there are options that are fully biodegradable with less intense composts, uh, but they all kind of require some specific equipment except for one PLA. So this new PLA is uh, biodegradable by its own, 100%. You can use composters or uh, it can just be in a bioactive environment. So if you threw the filament in a swamp, it could digest it. Uh, I'm not suggesting you do that, but um, this thing is fully biodegradable. Um, it's pretty new, so you might not be able to get a hold of it, but uh, options are coming along. Um, this one's more accessible. It's very cheap if you want to start printing. Uh, it's still hard to compost, but they plant a tree for everyone, and that kind of offsets carbon over time. I mean, there's issues with carbon offsetting instead of avoiding uh, carbon emissions, but at least this is pr a better option than your other ones. You can also recycle filaments. I'm not going to talk about that fully, but there is a resource in how to build your own recycler, uh, open source recycler, in the resources. So when you get this PDF, you're going to have all of these resources available to you. Um, and if you ever have questions or need inf more information, you can contact me. I'd be happy to help you out. And that's it. Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you, Matthew. Uh, Ma uh, Vanessa and Matthew are both uh, student uh, researchers from the Exagram Network. My name is Manuel Frère. I am general coordinator of Exagram, the international network for research creation uh, in uh, arts, cultures, and technologies. So I've prepared a few questions, and thank you for your workshop presentations. Uh, both of you are uh, conducting your uh, research and creation, which is a, a relatively new field. Uh, how do you, what is your process of articulating the research and the practice in your academic uh, studies and program? Maybe we'll start with Vanessa. Yeah, I'm uh, doing um, a PhD at Concordia, I'm in my fourth year. And uh, through this process of uh, research creation, it's really uh, uh, doing uh, the theory into practice. So it's really practice-based. Uh, as a textile designer, everything I, I read, I process, I, and then I restore into, uh, into my, uh, my, my workshop, working with dyes to, to equilibrate the theory and the practice. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it's, it's a little bit different. I'm often kind of stuck in the middle of reading research papers on how to do things and then going to the maker side and learning different techniques for making them. Uh, before doing this, I didn't know how to 3D print or anything, so I had to learn that to do the, the tangible approach. Um, but then there's, there's kind of two periods. The first will be reading papers and getting familiar and then followed by a long period of just making and experimenting uh, with tangible things. Mm -hmm. Both of you uh, mentioned uh, the access to resources, to information, and seeing that your research touches on not just on uh, research uh, understood in the academic sense, but also you work in different communities, in the makers' communities. Um, how is it uh, that you, um, you have found both difficulties in having access to resources. Matthew, you were just talking about uh, how little information is mm -hmm. available. Uh, how do you, Matthew, access, uh, collect all this data? And uh, does it motivate you to make it more accessible? Mm -hmm. So for the making aspect of it, uh, it was very difficult because when I started learning about making tangible things with 3D printing, et cetera, um, due to the pandemic, all the maker spaces were closed. So it was a little more difficult because I think usually you can just go in and people will help you out and you can learn. Um, so that side of it on um, regular everyday life is usually okay. Um, but the, the academic side for learning how to build the fuel cells was very difficult because first of all, most of the stuff is behind a paywall. I needed university access to get it. So if you're someone who's not at university, it's very difficult to learn how to do this. There's almost no articles on how to do it, et cetera, nothing publicly available. Um, and I'm not sure why that is, because even in the papers, they won't publish their circuits, they won't publish the parts they're using. And I, I assume it has something to do with um, copyright or um, selling it. But yeah, it was very difficult. And I was surprised that no one had built circuits or had ready-made things ready to go. There were a few people in the makerspace that had tried but the parts they were using were all discontinued. So mm -hmm. it's very temporal depending on the, make, the makers of the parts and um, research papers. Mm -hmm. And what about yourself, uh, Vanessa? How do you access, I mean, there are no recipes per se to do what you do. It's a lot of trial and error, but I believe there's, al there's already a community that is dedicated to dyes and international community. I know of different uh, practitioners who work also with this media. How do you access information and how do you share it? Um, yeah, so we, we are talking two different things here. There is the, the, the dyes made of uh, food waste. So there is a, a lot of um, tutorials on internet you can find easily. Everyone is trying a bit, but then, you know, as I, I'm, I was explaining in my, in my uh, um, workshop is you have to be able to be able to produce it again, you know, when you want to share it. So it's important to write everything you do to scale it up and it's by uh, making it and ma remaking it that you try you find the right recipe. Uh, concerning the, the bacteria, you really need to have um, a proper bio lab because you're working with the living. So thanks to the, the university, I have access to this bio lab. Uh, there is not much uh, 
and literature about it because it's quite new and recent. But uh, according to what I read, then uh, I process the information and I try by myself and observation is key. And mm -hmm. you see how uh, the bacteria, because it's so uh, reactive and lively that you, you can pro process and make uh, recipes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You mentioned something that is also part of uh, one of my questions, which is in regards of working with the living with slow processes and scaling. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, usually we, uh, usually or in most cases of research and development, you think ultimately of the scaling. But in both your cases, there are some, s some real uh, challenges mm -hmm. to uh, producing in large scale. Uh, how do you... How do you navigate that? I've seen mm -hmm. we've seen that it takes 31 hours on a microbial fuel cell to start producing energy that can feed mm -hmm. anything. So how do you and the community address that? Well, we need to firstly, I guess it depends on context, but um, deadlines are going to be a lot different. Uh, for producing research and data, um, it's going to take months to like a year to get usable data. The first time I built one of these, I would go into the studio every day and I'd take samples and I'd watch it grow and then periods where it would decline and then grow again and I kept monitoring it for months and then it died. So it's, it's hard to say because it is very different where I feel like a lot of data maybe takes months of preparation and then you have your data at, at the end. Some of them, it's, you can get it right away, but yeah, working with the living, you have to be patient and you have to monitor its health because you're not just uh, working with um, non-living materials. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. how do you uh, foresee the scaling of your experimentations, if uh, if if any? The, for me, it's really through networks and collaboration, and also uh, we need to find budget for that. So there are some programs like Mitax, for example that makes the connection between university research and industrial development. So this is an avenue uh, I'm considering, uh, discussing with many different uh, um, local actors who have the facilities, for example, to collect all this uh, waste at big, in big quantities, transform uh, my decoction, uh, liquid decoction in powders to make pigments to be able to store them at bigger scales, uh, contacting uh, local uh, dyers that are going to be able to test uh, not only uh, three meters of fabric, mm -hmm. but one, 100 meters of fabric. So it's like it's, uh, uh, it's scaling up step by step mm -hmm. through uh, meeting people and collaborating. And there is a deep interest mm -hmm. in this field uh, at the moment, especially locally in Montreal, where there is this uh, um, ecological transition and where fashion and textile is, uh, is part of uh, the program. Mm -hmm. so I suppose that uh, before scalability, there's stabilizing the process and stabilizing mm -hmm. the medium, which when you're working with the living is yet another challenge. Like you, I mean, you have to look after its health and you have to look after its well-being. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there, uh, my question would be, is there mechanical or technical processes by which you can stabilize first the living of your mm -hmm. creature in both your cases before you can start thinking about scaling? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I wanted to do with this cell here. Um, create a system that would take good care of the mosses by giving it a, an incubator and also have your microbial fuel cell built in and parts that are easily changeable if, if things need to, if things break or you need to change something. So once I had this designed, um, it was a lot easier. I didn't have to go to the studio every day and, and water them or I didn't have to check on them as much. Mm -hmm. and you could probably set up an automatic uh, data logger to, to get information as well if, you, if you're doing it remotely. Um, so the whole design process was kind of centered around that scalability and mm -hmm. being able to mm -hmm. reproduce it and keep it alive and keep it well. Mm -hmm. Okay, because in your case, Vanessa, you work perhaps more in a studio or sometimes a kitchen mm -hmm. in COVID context mm -hmm. rather than a lab, mm -hmm. which we associate more to stability mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, control the, the, the stability of your process? Uh, like again, I'm talking about two processes, like the food waste, I can really completely do it in my kitchen. Uh, and also I'm using uh, freezing, for example, to keep you know the, the dye because, because it's alive also, so it's molding with time. If I keep 
in, in the fridge, so I can it's why the process of uh, transforming the liquid into powder, drying mm -hmm. it up, uh, is a good uh, is a good way. Concerning the the living bacteria, um, I'm working with the same same strain for four years because the bacteria has different states. Like sometimes it's a slip. When you don't give it oxygen and nutrients, it's a slip. Mm -hmm. And when I want to reactivate it, uh, I give it oxygen and nutrients, and then it produces color. But at the end, I have to, to kill the bacteria to, to be able to wear it on the fabric. So there are different states. So you got to know your creature, so you now you rely on it for some stability. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We have to know, we have to collaborate, and uh, we have to understand the behavior. Like, for example, when I, I notice that he likes to be constrained, so I can work with it to make prints. So it's a kind of uh, yeah, knowing each other. Mm -hmm. Now, I've noticed also that uh, you, well, you, I, I've noticed because you mentioned that there is uh, a lot of different food waste mm -hmm. that you can, that you can mm -hmm. use and how I know that you are uh, interested in establishing connections with uh, the food, uh, food waste uh, systems and uh, here, uh, here in Montreal. Is that another aspect where you could uh, further develop your research? Yeah, exactly. Like the, the next step is to scale it up. So uh, not only uh, using my own food waste, but saying, OK, if we want to, to check that in a bigger scale, uh, contacting these people I'm in discussion uh, at the moment to try to uh, get bigger scale of uh, uh, waste, agricultural waste, mm -hmm. and then uh, dry them up because they have all the facilities dry them up and exactly. yeah and try the, the the stability of the recipes and and the bigger quantities mm, yeah. interesting i also have a question to to you matt in mm -hmm. regards to to the the materials that you use mm -hmm. um first time i've heard of microbial fuel cells was by a, a designer um james auger and he uses um um dying flies for example or dying okay. animals mm -hmm. uh, I, is that uh have you tried also working with non, um, I imagine, vegetable or? Um, I have not. Um, is this art piece carnivorous robots? I think no, it, it was uh, an installation where you have the, the fly tape okay. and the flies come and they stick to the, to the tape. It's a method that okay. is conventionally used. And then these are collected and as they decompose, they fuel a right. cell. Okay, yeah, because the first microbial fuel cell I ever heard of was also a similar project, which used flies mm -hmm. that were decomposing. But um, I have not there. I have been interested in trying it. So like stuff like this cell is meant for wastewater and like decomposing waste. But you have to kind of have a, a manure esque thing, mm -hmm. uh, or like um, you have to convert it into a compatible medium. But you could do it with agricultural waste for sure. That's a big one that's used in microbial fuel cells. Um, like wastewater and sewage systems, et cetera. But it's, it's kind of like a, it's a similar process in the way that the electrodes and the power circuits work, but um, it's very different in the, the life and the care of it because mm -hmm. it's decomposed matter. Um, it needs to be handled differently because like certain reactions can happen and it can like um, go off. And yeah, I haven't, it's on my to-do mm -hmm. list, but I haven't done it yet. I was thinking that uh, this would maybe bypass the, the caring aspect of it, mm -hmm. like since collecting dead matter would no longer supposedly mm -hmm. <laughs> implicate uh, caring for the the mm -hmm. maintenance of it. So mm -hmm. I just I just thought about that uh, that possibility if you had gone that avenue. I have a, a, a final question, maybe for for both of you, which is pertains again to go back to full circle to the beginning about the. Um, Conducting research uh, creation, I mean, both your practices can uh, stream into many different avenues, I mean, into exhibitions, into cultural milieu, uh, but also into, there's a very concrete research and possible development mm -hmm. to it, but also uh, establishing links with many other um, sectors. And so how do you find, uh, how do you navigate that uh, in your experiences so far in throughout your research? Like where have you exhibited? Where have mm -hmm. you presented? Where are the future avenues? Um, so for me, I have yet to present this one, but I actually did end up using this in an artwork. Um, I, I hope to you know, use it in future exhibitions um, and kind of just in the lab as a prototype for different exhibitions too. Like if you want to use fuel cells in an exhibition, you know these ones work. You can test it with that before you 
scale it up to something else. Um, but I guess my, my next area of focus is trying to get it into a kind of a maker space or mm -hmm. developing the fuel cells done, but developing the electronic board and having people available to download the files and order a board and just start. And then it gives people the opportunity to create their own things, whether they want to use them to make lights, um, use them for more practical applications, um, make art out of them, et cetera, um, or at least give them something that they can modify for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I guess my next step would be um, navigating those communities, making the connections, and, and releasing it to, to the public. Interesting. And mm -hmm. yourself, Vanessa, how um, do you see it? Of course, open? exhibitions are a good avenue. Like I did a, an exhibition last winter, mm -hmm. publication, conferences, workshops. But as a textile designer, I'm really looking to the application of processes and scaling it up to be able to give access to local uh, uh, fashion designers. And uh, what I'm, I'm interested in um, pursuing this research creation is the, the way your research, how, you know, at first is so personal that how much it's, uh, is it in connection with a bigger context like when I'm talking about Montreal or Quebec, uh, which uh, is very important to be aware of the initiatives that is happening in, in uh, circular economy and in fashion and textile in particular. So connecting, networking with these actors to be able to collaborate to, uh, to push this research further and bigger scale and hopefully like for example, who is gonna be able to, who has the facilities which dyers in Montreal have the facilities to dye 100 meters of fabric. So all these connections, mm -hmm. and but of course it's step by step, so recording bigger scales, um, stabilizing the recipe, then testing, and then um, practicing with fashion designers, the local uh, fashion ecosystem. Hmm? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for contributing to this uh, emergency programming at Ars Electronica which I would like to remind is the launching of a programming of the 2021-2022 interdisciplinary uh, season for Exagram, which, will, which starts now and will go on to June 2022. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.